Bonjour, talo for lava, kia ora tato. Greetings to everyone. Ko Karen Bearder Ho. I am SPREP's Threatened and Migratory Species Advisor, and it is my great pleasure to host this session today about nature's oceanic voyages. Marine megafauna, including migratory marine species, hold a special heart, place in the hearts and culture of Pacific peoples. Seabirds and whales, for example, indicated pathways on long distance human migrations across the Pacific and back. However, more than half of those listed on the Convention for Migratory Species found in the Pacific have a decreasing population trend. And for some, such as the leatherback turtle, their status in the Pacific is worse than the global situation. But today I'm excited that we have a lineup of experts on, on some of these species groups, and we will explore more about the enormous challenges these species face and how the Pacific is meeting this challenge with innovative local conservation action. After our speakers have all presented, we will have a panel discussion. So do send in your questions on the Q&A tab, and if we have time, we will put them to the panelists. And if not, we will still answer them online during or after the session. So our first speaker is Rochelle Constantine. Dr. Constantine is at the Biological Sciences School at the Institute of Marine Science at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, Aotearoa. She runs highly collaborative multidisciplinary projects on many species of whale and dolphin between the tropics and Antarctica. Rochelle is a founding member of the South Pacific Whale Research Consortium and currently leads the International Whaling Commission Southern Ocean Research Partnership Project on humpback whale connectivity. She is on the IUCN Important Marine Mammal Task Force and co-chairs the Pacific Region IMMA with Dr. Claire Garig from the IRD in New Caledonia. She says she is a shameless user of whales and dolphins to talk about more important issues facing the marine environment. <laughs> so please welcome Rochelle, you have the floor. <laughs> kia ora Karen, um, kia ora Fano. welcome to this first session and I thank you for tuning in. Um, I, as Karen says, I'm Rochelle Constantine and pleased to be talking to you today. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about South Pacific cetaceans. Um, they are the, the charismatic megafauna, they get far too much attention often, certainly in New Zealand throughout the world. Um, but I, I would argue less so uh, throughout the Pacific, given the rich biodiversity. So I'm going to talk a little bit today uh, about what we know uh, and, and sort of some of the challenges facing these animals and, and how perhaps we can move forward with this. There's a lot of opportunity. So the cetaceans in the, the Pacific and particularly the South Pacific region, this is a, a hugely vast um, complex geographic region. And I would argue one of the most complex you know, within the ocean. Uh, this means that the organisms that live in there, they've got everything from deep, deep canyon waters to very shallow nearshore, coastal lagoons and beaches. And the cetaceans, some of them, you know, are found year round very predictably with very small home ranges, whilst others uh, are only there for short periods of time to fulfill some part of their life function. There are a lot of different agreements been made and formed, a lot of partnerships um, between international organizations, uh, local organizations, governments, NGOs, research providers. Um, you know, I think some of the, the more compelling were, was the uh, Conventional Migra Migratory Species and SPREP Agreement in 2006. It's a memorandum of understanding about how to progress to understand the cetaceans in the Pacific and ensure their, their future survival. Um, there have also been a few whale, uh, whales and dolphins action plans that have been written. The, the most recent one ran out in 2017. Uh, again, you know, very comprehensive documents. But these, these these agreements are, they're often really aspirational and they, they're unable to be fulfilled just simply by the vastness of the space that we have to work in. Uh, and also because of that, we often know a lot about only a very few species, the very natural species such as spinner dolphins, humpback whales, and um, rough-toothed dolphins, bottlenose dolphins. But most of the, the taxa, the offshore taxa, we, we know virtually nothing about. There are a few areas, island groups, or particular regions 
um, or species that have very high levels of, of research attention um, comparatively throughout the region. One thing we are lucky is that throughout the South Pacific, there are um, an, a few universities that you know, have some really good research going on on cetaceans in the area. Often this isn't connected up that well, so you'll find some replication um, or or that knowledge not being disseminated either to the, the government or to SPRAP or to even other research organisations. And of course, there's the South Pacific Well Research Consortium, which I'm a member of. It's about 70 something members of, of um, the, that consortium now, which has been working since the early 1990s with a particular focus initially on the humpback whales, but increasingly on, on small cetaceans. So there's, there is some, we have some good knowledge about the animals in this place. The most recent um, initiative uh, is by the IUCN, um, which is the Important Marine Mammal Areas, or IMAs as they're known. So you'll see here a map of um, the world, all shaded in different ways. The completed ones um, are in dark blue. So the Mediterranean, and then of course the Pacific region. And we've only just recently, this needs to be updated, just recently finished Australia and New Zealand, and the Southern Ocean has now also been completed. So the, the idea is to understand important habitats for marine mammals. So this isn't a single taxa focused, it's actually focused on areas of importance for marine mammals and a high mammal um, density or abundance or seasonal use. The idea of, um, in the establishment of the task force is to identify key areas so that governments could use this to help make better informed decisions around either marine protection for marine mammals in an area, conservation management actions, future focused um, decisions. But something I heard recently was um, was called radical responsibility. I quite like that idea, you know, <laughs> actually going out there and, and, you know, showing acts of radical responsibility. Uh, the IMAs within the Pacific region, so Claire Gehrig and I um, chair this, co-chair this particular area, um, we have 20 important marine mammal areas identified. So these were identified at a workshop and then uh, uh, peer reviewed by external experts who then queried them and argued the evidence that was put forward before being declared. So it's not like we just decided what were important areas, we actually had to make a case. Most areas throughout the Pacific uh, region had uh, 15 plus um, species that we knew enough about to make a compelling argument of why this was an important area for marine mammals, which is, is quite impressive given how little we actually know throughout the region, but it was sufficient to, to I think, push forward and uh, highlighting the importance of these spaces. The New Caledonia with their 29 species actually reflects the intense amount of effort that is focused there. Um, uh, the French government, in particular, Fond Pacifique, fund a lot of research, but also NGOs the ERD, which Claire works for. So uh, this includes, of course, dugong in this uh, designation. But we have different species that can be key area, uh, the sort of a key species that anchors an area being an important marine mammal area. Um, spinner dolphins and humpback whales featured broadly across most of the areas. But in the Bismarck Sea region, killer whales and sperm whales were really, uh, this area was very important to them. And the Marquesas, the melon-headed whales, for example, it was very important. So there are quite different um, large whales, small dolphins, beaked whales, a number of different taxa. So it was pretty cool that we have 20 uh, immers declared. There are also um, four candidate immers. So these are areas where with just a little bit more information, uh, either more than maybe a grey literature report, some peer reviewed um, knowledge or a more comprehensive effort will become declared an important marine mammal area. So we've got um, Wallace and Fortuna, which most of the knowledge is from the Remoa, the French Remoa aerial surveys. Uh, it was comparable to Hawaii in diversity, despite the paucity of surveys in the area, mainly this aerial survey, there was a massive biodiversity um, in regards to cetaceans there. Um, um, sorry, I'm Wallace and Fortuna, yeah, uh, mostly small dolphins and beaked whales. Vanuatu, it's um, recognized as a humpback whale breeding ground. Um, 
is almost certainly high diversity there, but it's very poorly surveyed. And like many of the regions of the Pacific, it's got a complex series of atolls and islands and islets and seamounts, which makes it challenging. And then of course, there are 20 additional areas of interest. These are places like, well, with a bit more effort on the part of everyone, we actually um, probably could get these declared as, as IMAs. And because this is an IUCN initiative, it can hold you know, considerable weight with some governments. We're already seeing action by New Zealand on this. So for the cetaceans in this region, you know, the threats are, I guess, in some ways generic <laughs> uh, throughout all of the world and probably something you'll hear repeated again and again throughout the course of this conference. Uh, but I think one of the, the threats that's often not spoken about is the degradation or loss of cultural knowledge by the Pacific people. Um, certainly um, large scale commercial whaling, which almost wiped out um, particularly the humpback whales, but the large blue whale populations, fin whales, say whales, a number of those very large whales, sperm whales, that spend all or some of their time in the Pacific region. That during the 1900s, the loss of those species, I think, you know, we know that there was a concomitant loss of, of knowledge and cultural connection to those um, species, which is, I think, a great shame for all of the Pacific peoples, but but the world in general, um, because that often holds a lot of the information about what we know about the ecology and distribution and behavior of these species. Uh, and as, as Western scientists, often that you know, traditional knowledge can be really valuable uh, in our understanding of what's going on. I think um, increasingly in more, in more recent times, you know, than, than the immediate whaling concern, uh, interactions with fisheries, either through bycatch where animals are entangled in gear and, and die or through entanglement. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about these uh, uh, later. Um, tourism pressure, which is, is quite um, intense for some species in some areas. Direct takes, so uh, hunting or um, uh, for, for food or for uh, cultural purposes. Um, and also direct takes for the aquarium trade, which is something particular the Solomons I'll talk about, and then of course climate change. So uh, just a couple of these to highlight in more detail because they're areas we know a fair amount about um, for our cetaceans in the Pacific. Um, tourism in particular has a, a blessing and a curse. Tourism done well can uh, be, you know, have relatively low impact on the target species, and it can have immense economic benefit um, for the animals. Uh, Mark Oram several years ago did an assessment, and I think he calculated each whale in Tonga uh, in its lifetime was worth about $5 million to the Tongan economy per whale, which you know is, is a, a remarkable amount of money um, per whale, uh, and, and truly makes a difference for, for some of these um, smaller economy states. Tourism has largely focused in the Pacific on humpback whales, but also spinner dolphins, um, melon-headed dolphins, um, uh, pantropical spotted dolphins uh, can be you know, uh, exposed to tourism as well. For the humpbacks, um, one of the things that we know is that numbers were extremely low. In Tonga, we got down bet to between 10 and 15 breeding females. Um, when whaling stopped, they're now about 50% recovered. Um, which is good, they're recovering slower than their Australian cousins. But we also know that there are impacts from tourism. So whilst the population continues to recover, or populations throughout the broader South Pacific region continue to recover, um, we do know of impacts from uh, tourism. And there are the Pacific Islands regional guidelines uh, developed in 2008 that have been really helpful in a variety of different mechanisms to manage um, tourism on cetaceans throughout the Pacific have been adopted by different countries. We know that there is behavioral change by whales through intense tourism and concern in particular for mother calf pairs. And so regulations must protect the most vulnerable of the animals. We know also that a stable industry works. So, you know, having, if you have licensing and permitting, slowing down, um, minimizing the number of permits and creating a stable industry makes a difference. And that's been proven in New Caledonia, um, especially with some enforcement. And there's land-based models where land-based whale watching, um, Cook Islands being an example of that, but also mixed species, taking the pressure off one species to, to look at different species uh, should be built into tourism uh, in the future, especially with the immers, we realized how many species were actually in and around these islands. So rather than just going to see humpback whales diversifying. And of course that mixed model tourism where there's cultural components as well as um, the, 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 bio, the animals themselves included. 
fisheries interactions. There's no competition at all with fisheries by most of the baleen whales, with the exception of brooders whales that, that feed and, and live in the warmer waters year round. But all others don't have competition for food. They come to the tropical regions for breeding. There's some long line depredation that's been pretty well documented. Killer whales, false killer whales, pilot whales, the often commonly known as the blackfish, and that's competition for prey and one of the challenges for the fishing industry. Um, often with some, you know, not great behaviours, um, shooting at animals and, and driving at them, scaring them away, causing injury can be a concern for some populations. Um, also bycatch, direct bycatch of small cetaceans and gill nets and um, those sort of monofilament net types. Um, ghost gear being a huge problem and it's usually lethal. But also entanglement of, of whales and gear and you can see this whale entangled in some um, long line here, humpback whale. Um, there's been some disentanglement training by the International Whaling Commission in the Pacific region. If the whales don't get disentangled and if they're attached to a large net or a very exceptionally long line mass or um, they just simply can't get disentangled, they will usually die a slow and painful death. So these fisheries interactions are a real concern in some areas. And of course direct takes cultural hunting and consumption. Um, so for food, for currency, it can impose quite intense pressures on some populations, especially small coastal populations. We often think that, you know, when we see spotted dolphins, um, for example, spinner dolphins, you'll often see tens or hundreds of them. But our understanding of, of the genetic diversities of these populations have been uh, quite limited. And there's very poor record keeping of um, of the, the, these potential impacts. Uh, there was a new species of beaked whale, the Derinia galas um, whale, discovered from a fire pit in Kiribati. So the whale had been either stranded and then was consumed and the bones from the fire pit, we were able to extract DNA and discover a new species. So, you know, there's so much information and, and uh, knowledge about these animals that, that goes missing, uh, especially uh, in these places where people are interacting with them on a regular basis, but we know very little about them. A dedicated study in the Solomon Islands in 2013 by Mark Oremus um, actually showed uh, over time, so this is from 1976 through to 2013, and you'll see the, the um, annual dolphin catch. So it can be hundreds to a few thousands of dolphins taken um, for bride price. And what they found actually is that the price had increased quite dramatically, and it seemed like increasing price for teeth was driving the market with one village who had stopped hunting the dolphins starting to hunt because they could make some good money out of it. But the villagers there were very open to conservation implications of exploitation and more conversation. And of course, Michelle, was, you have to, to, I am, to I'm just speed up now. a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, there's direct takes, of course, um, with the Solomon Islands. This was for captivity, not linked to hunting. This has a high risk industry. Um, and it actually, some genetic work showed that these were really small populations of only a few hundred and they were vulnerable to um, decline and it was a non-sustainable industry. And this is my final um, slide on climate change. You know, climate change is, is a real challenge. What we know, these are humpback whales. The um, green lines show where the whales are currently. And with climate change, we anticipate that they will move south. And that means that these breeding grounds will shift for these whales in time because these whales have a thermal tolerance. And we don't know what is happening because of climate change in Antarctica and krill productivity, but what happens in Antarctica affects the whales that we see in the South Pacific. So what do we need? Well, we need some good data collection. There are many ways of doing this. And I think more dedicated focus on that we will understand and be able to feed into these IMA processes. Um, and then we have to deal with some of these things that threaten our um, cetaceans throughout the broader Pacific region and that tourism works for the animals as well as for the communities. And there's lots of pathways to do that. So um, kia ora tato and um, merci and thank you for listening. <coughs> Fantastic. Thanks very much. That was a very, very good um, introduction to um, the incredible diversity of cetaceans that we have across the Pacific. So without any further ado, um, we'll just go straight on to our, our next speaker, which is um, Richard Hamilton. So Dr. Hamilton is the director of the Nature Conservancy's Melanesia program. He actually grew up in a coastal community in Papua New Guinea, I found out and that instilled in him a love of the sea and listening to fishing stories. 
Uh, this led him to complete his MSc and PhD research in a remote fishing community in the Solomon Islands, where he studied the ecological, economic and cultural factors that structure coral reef fisheries. Rick has been with the TNC's Melanesia program for the past 15 years, working with communities, universities, governments and industry on a diverse range of marine and terrestrial management issues. Rick is an adjunct research fellow at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at James Cook University, and he's currently working with partners to understand how community-based conservation efforts can be linked to improved livelihood initiatives. Rick, you have the floor. Rick, are you muted? Okay, can you hear me now? Ah, yep, thanks. we've got you. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Karen, and for telling me to get off mute. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some satellite tracking work that we've been doing on female hawksbill turtles in the Solomon Islands and sort of some of the ways that that information has helped inform site-based conservation and policy. But before I do that, I just wanted to give a, a quick overview of turtles in general in the Pacific. So there's five species, the green hawksbill, leatherback, loggerhead and olive ridley turtles found in the Pacific and nesting in the Pacific, green by far the most abundant. Um, the Western Pacific leatherback, the South Pacific loggerhead uh, listed as critically endangered in our region. And of course, the hawksbill turtle is listed as critically endangered globally. Um, there's a wide range of threats to turtle species in the Pacific. Probably one of the most pronounced one is um, take for subsistence and sale. So countries like Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands have some of the highest consumption rates of turtles of anywhere on earth. Uh, a recent study that was led by Simon Votu um, from the Nature Conservancy showed that in the Solomons alone, about 10,000 turtles are killed every year for small scale subsistence and also illegal trade. Um, there's also, of course, uh, bycatch issues with longline fisheries in the higher seas, uh, climate change impacts causing erosion of beaches, and of course, with increasing sand te temperatures, increasing feminization of the clutches. So you're predominantly getting uh, female baby turtles only. And then um, of course, development, land-based development impacting nesting beaches, be that large scale mining or more just sort of population growth from small coastal communities. And then issues of plastics and entanglement as we heard in the previous speaker. So generally across the region, it's, you know, that the new state of environment report by Sprit has shown that by and large they're deteriorating. But I actually wanna spend most of my talk giving a, a somewhat more positive story, I guess. And I'm gonna be talking about the Arnavons Community Marine Park. This is one of the, isle of, one of the islands in the Arnavons Park. The Arnavons uh, represent a partnership between the communities which have traditional or ac access rights to the Arnavons that's the um, communities of Kia, Vagina, and Katapika in the Solomons. And the Arnavons is located between Isabel and Choiza Province. It's also a partnership with the Nature Conservancy and provincial and national government. And it really represents, I guess, a 25 year conservation story or 25 years plus. And I think this is important to keep in mind when we're talking about recovery for these species, it does take a long time. But so um, the communities came together and established the Arnavons Community Marine Conservation Area back in 1995. And the men and women from the surrounding communities have been conserving the turtles there since then. We did an um, analysis of some of the nesting numbers on the Arnavons, sort of just pre-protection in 1995 through to 2012. And you can see that there's been quite a good increase in the number of clutches laid in the Arnavons since protection. Uh, it's improved about 200% post 1995. It's probably worth keeping in mind that although that's encouraging, uh, it's still a lot lower. This little dot up here represents an estimated number of clutches per night in the 1960s. So it's still a lot lower than it was in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, this rookery would have already been in decline for over hundred years. 
So I like to say it's, you know, it's out of the emergency department into the main ward of the hospital in terms of the status of that rookery. Um, so the main point of my talk, talking about the satellite tracking work, uh, we really had two, two, two interests. We wanted to see if the park boundaries were sufficient to protect the nesting turtles during their breeding period. And, and when the boundaries were established in 1995, it was really just a guesstimate. Um, so the Arnavons encompasses about 150 square kilometers, most of which is, is uh, water. And it's more or less two to three kilometers from the nesting beach is protected. So we're interested in that. And then we were also interested to see what the post nesting uh, migrations in the foraging grounds of these animals were once they've completed nesting in the Arnavons. So just quickly on, on the methods, we tagged 30 uh, female hawksbill turtles with satellite transmitters after they'd completed nesting between 2016 and 2018. We used FastLock GPS tags, which are perfect for answering the question if the park boundaries are sufficient because they give you a very accurate location when the turtle surfaces to breathe um, to within about 50 meters of the true location of the animal. And, and we, we tracked uh, tracked these turtles for over 9,000 days overall. Um, and then we were able to estimate the home ranges of the turtles to see if they do stay within the park boundaries. And we also looked at the uh, migration distances once they'd left the nesting grounds. This is just a photo of John Peter. He's our conservation lead in Isabel province, uh, helping one of the females on her way back to the sea after having a tag attached. So I'll just explain this uh, insert a little bit here. Um, the dotted line represents the park boundaries of the Arnavons. This is one individual turtle. Uh, the numbers represent different nesting events. So number one is where the turtle nested prior to tag deployment. And the other numbers are subsequent nesting clutches within a nesting season. Uh, you can see that while this turtle spent about 90 days on the nesting grounds. She nested first on Kerry Hickapa, that's the one for number one, but then subsequently she went across and laid all her other clutches at Sikapo Island. But overall, we had over 1100 days of turtles spent within the nesting, inter-nesting period. And more than 98% of the time they stay within the park boundaries. So it, it's certainly quantified that the existing park boundaries seem to do their job. The little red contours show 50% home range, that's where they are most of the time, and the blue contours show where they are the rest of the time. Um, and, and none of the turtles that we tracked between 2016 and 2018 nested outside of the Arnavons. I guess the uh, one of the things from a conservation point of view that the satellite tracking really helped to highlight was that we had a real issue with poaching on one of the islands within the Arnavons group in uh, 2016. So the larger island, I showed a photo of it earlier on, Sikapo, had, had a pretty significant poaching problem in 2016. That island historically didn't have a permanent ranger presence. And two of the turtles, which we actually tagged in 2016, when they went back to nest again at Sikapo, were subsequently killed by poachers. So, you know, and, and I think as I showed in that previous slide, even turtles which are coming to nest at Kerry Hikapa, which is number one here, where there was a permanent station, uh, you know, a lot of the time we're moving across the Sikapo to nest. So on the basis of that, we built another ranger station at Sikapo in 2017. That's a, a photo of the ranger station here. And that has been staffed um, permanently since 2017 in an attempt to address the poaching issues. The other um, way in which the satellite tracking was you know, useful early on, and, and this was like the early 2016 results were shared with various stakeholders of the ACMP board, Isabel and Choisel Provincial Government and the Ministry of Environment. And it, and it helped to really demonstrate quite clearly the existing park boundaries were sufficient and that there really wasn't a need to expand the uh, extent of the park boundaries prior to having it registered as a national park. And in May 2017, the ACMP was actually established as the country's first national park. And some of those photos uh, just show the celebrations on that particular day. So just a, a couple of examples how, how, how the satellite information was, was useful for informing conservation practice and policy. Um, the other 
aspect of this, which is interesting, I guess, and really gets to the nature of this, this topic of this idea of shared resources. Uh, this is the post nesting migration routes of turtles. Uh, once they've completed nesting in the Solomons and the Anavon Islands. Purple lines, oh, sorry, red lines are 2018, purple 2017 and blue 2018. And the dashed lines represent turtles where their transmitter failed prior to them reaching their foraging ground. But what you can see really clearly there is that most turtles are returning to distant foraging grounds in Australia, Papua New Guinea, New Caledonia, etc. And in fact, for a hawksbill turtle population, the mean post nesting migration distance was over 1800 kilometers, which is I think is the longest reported anywhere for a hawksbill population. So just, uh, just to finish up a few um, uh, points which just sort of highlighted and I think are interesting that the recovery we've seen to date at the uh, Arnavons with the local conservation efforts is sort of attributable to a number of factors. Firstly, um, it's the long-term conservation efforts on the Arnavons. So there's been rangers based there permanently doing a month on month off shift since 1995. And I'd have no doubt at all that without those efforts, um, you know, that rookery would be virtually extinct. So that, that has been critical. Uh, another aspect is that the boundaries as the satellite tracking showed are sufficient. And I think that's important because um, in the surrounding areas outside of the park, there is a lot of turtle harvest. And the general picture in the Solomons is declining catch rates of turtles, which indicate unsustainable fisheries. And I guess the other, other point, which is interesting too, is that you have this tiny little marine park in the Solomons, but a lot of your turtles are returning to highly protected foraging grounds in Australia. So protected areas separated by over several thousand kilometers, but very, very important for the long-term recovery. So uh, final slide, some take home messages. I think, uh, you know, conservation for these species is, is a long-term slog. It's not, not a quick solution. I think long-term commitment and effort is essential. Uh, I think the satellite tracking showed that if you involve multiple stakeholders in research, you can get those preliminary results uh, being useful well beyond sort of peer review publication. And uh, the other thing of interest is that, you know, once again, these highly migratory species really need both site-based conservation efforts, but also regional responses. And I just wanted to end with a photo of some of the many participants who were involved in this research. And I will stop there because I think I'm over time. Thank you very much. Well, wow, thanks very much, Rick. That was very fascinating. That's fantastic work that's happening there at the Anavans and, and certainly a good model uh, for other parts of the Pacific. Um, so we'll go straight on to uh, our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Christina Shaw. Uh, Dr Shaw originally uh, is a veterinarian surgeon from England and has lived in Vanuatu for the last 12 years. Uh, in 2014, she started a conservation organisation, the Vanuatu Environmental Sciences Society, after completing a Master's in Veterinary Conservation Medicine from Murdoch University in Australia. Bess has implemented projects to protect dugongs and seagrass meadows, including being the implementing partner of the GEF funded dugong and seagrass conservation projects. Other projects focus in Vanu on Vanuatu's threatened and endemic species, such as Vanuatu's flying foxes. Christina first encountered dugongs while scuba diving in Port Vila, and she and her husband are now partners in the scuba diving business, Big Blue Vanuatu. Both Bess and Big Blue have been raising awareness about the problem of plastics in our oceans and have conducted cleanups in the water and on the land and the data from which has been used to support the single-use plastic bans that have recently come into force in Vanuatu. So please welcome Christina. Christina, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much there, Karen, for the introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. My internet has been a little bit unstable today, so I hopefully I will be um, not dipping in and out too uh, quickly. So yes, I'm here to talk about um, dugongs in the Pacific. Um, so this is um, an image of the range of dugongs globally. So they're found throughout the Indian Ocean and also in the western part of this Pacific. So they're not uh, found in every um, Pacific Island country, only those on the western border. So Palau up in the north, then down through Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and New Caledonia. 
And of course, Australia has a significant population of dugongs, but I'm not going to um, talk about the Australian dugongs in this presentation. So what do we know about the status, the population status of dugongs in the Pacific? Well, um, not very, very much, unfortunately. Um, they're not the easiest animals to study. Um, they don't come on shore at all. Uh, they stay primarily in the water and often in quite murky water. Um, they, mostly in the Pacific Islands, they have quite small populations, so we think, over wide geographic areas. The distribution of dugongs is fairly well um, known because of sighting records um, throughout the countries where they live. Um, and they tend to have areas where they have more dugongs than in other places. Um, and that's usually where you have sheltered lagoons and bays where there's more seagrass. So that um, seems like a, a logical um, observation. But the population status is um, hard to determine because we don't know how many dugongs are living in most of the countries in the Pacific. Um, and when we don't know that have the numbers, we can't ascertain the trends over time. Um, what are, and what are the main threats to dugongs uh, in the Pacific? Um, it's similar to the threats globally um, and bycatch, uh, particularly in gill nets, is um, one of the biggest threats uh, all over the world. Um, uh, dugongs um, live in the coastal areas in the same places where coastal communities go fishing um, and therefore there is an um, interaction uh, uh, with the gillnet fishery. Boat strike is also an important uh, cause of uh, problems to dugongs. Intentional hunting as well, so poaching. Uh, so even though there are national laws to protect um, most of the dugongs in most of the states in the Pacific, the, um, there is poaching. So the enforcement of the laws is, um, is a problem. Loss of seagrass sea habitats. Um, we're losing seagrass habitats around the world. We don't know what's happening really with our seagrass habitats in the Pacific. So there's little research on, on the seagrasses as well. Um, so we don't know how much of the loss of habitat is impacting our dugongs either. And then disturbance either from inappropriate tourism interaction. So um, similar to what Rochelle was saying uh, earlier, um, Tourism can is a double-edged sword. It can do good for conservation, but it can also be very problematic. But there has been quite a, a little, um, quite a bit of research going on um, over the region, and probably the most research has been done in New Caledonia by Chris Clagger and Claire Garrick um, and their team. Uh, the gold standard for assessing populations is uh, aerial surveys. And uh, historically, those have always been done with airplanes or helicopters. Um, and obviously that is uh, very expensive, um, particularly if you have small dugong populations over a very large geographic area. So um, there are not many aerial surveys that have been done in the Pacific, but they have been in New Caledonia. Um, and they started in, in 2003, the estimate was a, of around about 2,000 um, individuals. However, they've had aerial surveys done since 2008, 2011 and 2012, where um, the population is estimated to be between six and 800 individuals. So they're not sure if the 2003 estimate wasn't a particularly robust estimate and it was an overestimation. Um, but since from 2008 to 2012, the population does appear to have been stable. Um, and the other interesting uh, thing is the moving from aerial surveys with fixed wing aircrafts to um, drones, the use of drones. So modern technology is um, allowing us to study these animals at a much lower cost. So hopefully we'll be able to fill that um, knowledge gap uh, in the coming years in other countries as well. Um, the aerial surveys, um, as well as the, um, some acoustic tagging, has also helped to um, um, uh, reveal some of the behaviours of the dugongs in and where they're, what habitat they're using. So that, that's been some quite interesting work as well. Um, so dugongs aren't the easiest animals to tag. Um, 
And the advice really is, um, unless you know how many dugongs you have in your population and you've got a, um, a reasonably large population, it's best not to try and catch dugongs because there is mortality associated with that. So some of the countries that have smaller um, dugong populations, tagging, satellite tagging is not, not recommended until we actually know that we have um, a stable and a large enough population of, of dugongs. Um, there has been some genetic studies done as well. Um, and the dugongs in New Caledonia are shown to be distinct from the Australian population. But because um, genetic studies have not been done from the other Pacific islands in great detail, then we don't know if there's um, a relationship between the populations in Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands, um, and if how much movement there is between um, those countries. There's also been quite a, a bit of research going on in Palau, and again, using drones, um, so aerial surveys, but also underwater cameras, so logging um, film and still images of dugongs, which in known areas, so in their particular um, hotspot, uh, their dugong hotspot, um, where they are looking at the behavior of the dugongs um, and seeing how they're using their um, lagoon with the seagrass, depending on tide and, and other, um, other measures. So that's been quite interesting. However, the data that's been collected from the aerial surveys isn't um, sufficient to be able to create a population estimate. Um, so we don't really know how many dugongs live in Palau. There has been an estimate of 50 to 100 animals um, uh, given, but um, that's not supported by um, surveys. Uh, and it's suspected that there probably are a lot more. One of the uh, images from the drones surveys uh, that were done just in this one um, protected area was 59 animals in one herd. So I think it's pretty clear that there's more than 50, um, but how much more, we don't know. And again, genetic studies um, were done um, with the help of uh, researchers in Australia. Um, and we, again, because there are no genetic studies from the closest regions, um, which would be for Palau is the Philippines and Thailand, we can't really draw conclusions as to um, how closely related the populations are between, between the different uh, countries. So one initiative that happened, um, if, uh, now it's ended in 2018, was the uh, Jeff Five uh, funded Dugong and Seagrass Conservation Project, which was put together by the Dugong, um, the CMS Dugong uh, MOU Secretariat. Uh, and Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands were two of eight developing countries that were part of that um, initiative. And in both Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands, um, there was uh, quite a lot of work done on awareness raising. Um, there was policy work done uh, and the Solomon Islands passed um, a fisheries regulation that protects dugongs in the Solomons now, which was um, excellent results for that project. Um, and then we've also done some work on, on seagrass monitoring. So I'll just share with you um, the results of what we've done in Vanuatu. Although we do have some drones and we are working with Chris, Chris Kleger to uh, start some drone surveys in Vanuatu, we started off a bit more low tech, um, but still managed to gain quite a lot of information using the CMS Dugong catch by catch uh, questionnaire survey. So we went throughout Vanuatu um, and interviewed over 500 fishers and, and villagers um, and th uh, through um, the whole archipelago um, and found that dugongs are sighted pretty much everywhere in Vanuatu. Um, there's also seagrass in um, a lot of places, but often in just small pockets. Um, the general perception of people in Vanuatu was that the numbers of dugongs were not decreasing, but there is no scientific um, studies to back that up um, at all. So that's just a perception of the people. The, um, and they are seen as important. Gillnet fishing is very common um, and 
nets are often left unattended, including overnight. Um, so that is a, um, one of the biggest threats to dugongs in Vanuatu. And a lot of people um, cite the, mentioned that tourism was a reason that dugongs are important. So there is potential for uh, inappropriate tourism interaction in Vanuatu being a problem for dugongs, which is why we developed um, a guideline for how to interact with dugongs. And the premise of that was that um, uh, uh, we have a reputation here in Vanuatu of having friendly dugongs, um, and we want to, to make sure that the dugongs have, um, their, have a positive experience every time they come into contact with people, um, as well as the people having um, a, a once in a lifetime experience when they come to Vanuatu and interact with the dugong. So we've created these guidelines, but it's not just for tourism, it is for um, boat drivers and anybody that's in the water and using the water where dugongs are. Um, and also we've created a code of conduct for um, tourism operators as well and how they should be reacting, uh, interacting with the dugongs and what they should be telling their customers. So what are the next steps for dugongs in the Pacific? Well, obviously there is quite a data gap, a knowledge gap um, in the science about um, our dugongs and how many we have, uh, how the seagrass uh, beds are, um, what is uh, sort of how much poaching is going on and what are the drivers behind it. Uh, we need to better understand the threats posed by the gill nets uh, and also boat strike. And then it would be very interesting to try and do some more genetic testing of those places where we don't have good records so we can try and understand the linkages between the populations um, of the different countries. Um, and they research on behavior and um, habitat use um, is also important, uh, particularly when you're looking at whether the dugongs are um, in protected areas or taboo local, um, local conservation areas as well. Then obviously there's the conservation actions that will help our dugong population, even when we don't know uh, too much about them, but strengthening the legislation where necessary. But as I said, we have quite a lot of uh, laws that protect dugongs in Vanuatu. So the enforcement of those regulations is essential. Um, and then addressing those other threats as well. So uh, looking at gill nets, boat strike, protecting the seagrass habitat, and then raising awareness at all levels from the community up through to local and national governments. One thing that will help is um, a there is a, a dugong and seagrass research toolkit that has been created um, by or developed by the dugong technical group which um, assists the uh, dugong or the CMS dugong MOU secretariat uh, who look at dugong conservation globally. Um, and they've created this research toolkit to help um, develop the research questions and work out the best methodologies um, to answer those research questions. So that's a very useful tool that's come on board um, in the recent years. So we'd like to thank all of the people that have helped um, and assisted us uh, doing our research in Vanuatu. Um, so we've been funded by the Great Local Ecosystem Partnership Fund, also the um, Global Environment Facility through the Dugong and Seagrass Conservation Project, and we work alongside the Vanuatu Fisheries Department and the Department of Environment, and we also like to thank the Dugong um, MOU Secretariat for their, and the technical group for their support, and also our colleagues across the Pacific that are doing good work on dugongs throughout the Pacific. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Christina. That was fantastic. Um, we learned a lot about about dugongs from that, and um, yeah, interesting to see uh, uh, how difficult it is to determine how many there actually are, and therefore to understand how how threatened they are. So. Quickly moving on to our final speaker today, so hopefully we might have a bit of time at the end if the um, session managers can allow us to have a bit of extra time at the end for a discussion. But our final speaker today um, is Andre Rain. Dr. Rain is the project manager for Kauai Endangered Seabird Recovery Project. 
and Andre worked on bird conservation projects throughout the world, including Bermuda, where he worked on the Cajal, the endangered Bermuda petrel. He's also worked in Zambia, Peru, and England. Before moving to Kauai, Andre spent four years as the conservation manager for BirdLife Malta, where he coordinated all research actions on BirdLife Malta's EU Life Yalkuin Shearwater project. This project was the largest conservation initiative of its kind in Malta and focused on reversing the decline of the near threatened Yalkin shearwater. I have pleasure in introducing Andre. Andre, you have the floor. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you everyone for um, sitting through our session and uh, I'm going to be talking to you this evening in my time zone uh, about nature's oceanic voyagers, uh, the seabirds in this case. So um, the region I'm going to be discussing uh, today is the Oceania region, um, which, uh, as you can see from this map, um, is a large area of ocean and also um, different countries and islands. So it's a, a really large area uh, which is replete with seabirds. This is just some examples of the seabirds that we have in our region, um, ranging from albatross to shearwaters and petrels, frigate birds and terns, a whole range of really rich diversity of species. Um, as well as the, these various birds that we have, there's also other more enigmatic species, things like the Fiji petrel, uh, which was once thought extinct and was only recently rediscovered. Its breeding grounds are still being sought. Um, and other species, which um, may be species we don't really know yet, like um, this beautiful little bird on the bottom right, which is the tentatively called the New Caledonia or Coral Sea storm petrel. So because this area is, um, you know, in some areas relatively poorly studied, there's certainly other species potentially out there to be, to be discovered or rediscovered. Um, within this diversity, uh, there's also um, unfortunately a lot of species that are um, threatened. Um, on the IUCN red list, we're looking at approximately a third of the birds, um, the seabirds that are in the region being listed as either vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered or near threatened. So many of them are not doing well. And so for my presentation, the first thing I'm gonna do is just give us a brief overview of the, the main threats um, that these birds face within the region, and then follow up with um, a bit of a case study on our work here on Kauai in Hawaii on how we're tackling some of these threats. So the major threats, and I just you know point your attention to this resource here, the Pacific Islands Regional Seabird Action Plan 2020 to 2025 from SPREP. A lot of really good information in there, which delves into many of these topics in more detail. So the first, um, and um, you know, these are species that threaten not just seabirds, but many native species across the region, are invasive species. Um, things like cats, rats, and pigs, lots of mammalian species that are out there that um, the seabirds have, had, uh, have not evolved with and are powerless against. Also avian species like the barn owl there on the top right, which in Hawaii was introduced in the late 60s to combat rats, um, but end up uh, taking a, an interest in eating seabirds as well. And then reptiles like the brown tree snake, um, which can have devastating impacts on our environment. Next up is habitat destruction. And this can be really large scale habitat destruction, like um, you know, the clearing of vast areas of forest um, for oil palm plantations or um, the clearing of forest and breeding grounds for agriculture and urbanization. There's an aerial view of um, Honolulu here in Oahu, um, where um, you know, lots of the habitat is just being concreted over. And with urbanization comes infrastructure issues too. So for example, power lines, um, seabirds can collide with power lines, which can kill them or injure them. Um, they also have a really serious um, problem with light attraction. Um, either on land, like the bottom left, that's a hotel here on Kauai with extremely bright lights and seabirds are attracted to bright lights. And often at sea, this, this photo here on the right, which is a pretty incredible one um, from Dan Barton, um, was actually taken in Alaska, um, so out of the region, but clearly shows the impact that lights can have on seabirds at sea, where you can just attract huge numbers of birds to um, oceanic vessels or indeed oil platforms and the like. Climate change. Um, unless you're willfully ignoring science, everyone is uh, more than aware of the issues of climate change, be they the complete disappearance of islands like the, the East Island there on the top left in the French, French Frigate Shoals in 2018, we're losing islands within the region. We're also getting more and more storms, huge hurricanes, which are having devastating impacts across the region to nesting seabirds and everything else. Um, and the changes in our oceanic temperatures 
um, where uh, as ocean waters heat and cool in different areas, this has impacts on uh, marine organisms, the prey that the seabirds and other marine animals uh, rely upon. Bycatch and overfishing, and here I don't mean small scale local fishing, um, but industrial level fishing can have serious impacts in terms of bycatch, catching and drowning seabirds that get hooked on lines to the removal of huge, um, a huge biomass of uh, fish and other marine organisms from the sea. Um, these include things like tuna, which um, many seabirds rely upon to drive their prey up to the surface so they can get to them, or things like squid, which the seabirds will actually rely on themselves. And marine pollution, uh, there's areas of the sea now in the region which are, you know, actually have their own plastic names because there's so much plastic. Um, plastic is a really serious issue within our seas. Um, we've all seen these horrible pictures like the one on the bottom right of albatross literally starving to death um, because they're just being fed plastic by their parents. You have these sort of ghost nets floating along in the sea that are catching seabirds and other marine organisms. And then um, when tankers run aground on our reefs, we end up with catastrophic oil spills. And lastly, if you think about that map of um, the region, this huge open area of sea scattered with islands and different countries, um, there's a lack of knowledge, um, not just for where our common species are, but also even more importantly, some of the many rare species. This bird on the top left is the Vex petrel. Um, both Karen and myself were involved in a, a um, project looking to see if we could identify where these birds are breeding. And if you don't know where they're breeding, then um, you basically can't help protect them. And so there's a, there's a, when, when you think about these birds, like the bottom right is actually a Bex petrel flying at sea. They're small, and many of them are just small, rare dots out in the open ocean and tracking them, finding them, and then locating them in these sort of extremely remote forests can be extremely difficult indeed. So I'll just um, talk about some of the threats, um, some of those threats um, in a Kauai context. For those of you who don't know uh, where Kauai is, we're in uh, the Hawaiian Islands, the northernmost Hawaiian Island um, there. And my project's the Kauai Endangered Seabird Recovery Project. And we focus on, as the name suggests, the endangered seabirds of Kauai, there's three of them. The first is the Newell Shearwater. We have 90% of the world population, so we're basically the last refuge of the species. It's less listed as critically endangered. We also have a third of the world's population of the Hawaiian petrel, the endangered Hawaiian petrel. And then our last species is the band rump storm petrel. Um, this is actually listed as least concern, but federally it's listed as endangered. And recent genetic um, work has shown that uh, this species is actually probably a, at least a distinct subspecies, if not species. So even more important to study and protect them. And these are the kind of environments that uh, they nest in on, on Kauai. They're in the most remote parts of the island now. They've been pushed into mainly the Northwest of the island. Um, these are really steep, topographically challenging areas to work in. Um, the weather's constantly changing. Uh, the birds nest in really dense native forest undergrowth with a canopy of native forest above. Um, and of course, they come in at night and are only on, in their colonies at night. So working within this terrain on these species at night um, presents its own series of challenges. So I'll just walk you guys through how we've tackled these various threats on this island. The first is power lines. Um, actually, this last screen shows a particularly bad power line in the island. You can see that this one actually stretches right across the middle of the island where the birds are breeding and passing to and from. And um, we are estimating many thousands of birds, between two and a half and over 4,000 birds being killed annually um, on the power lines. This is because the power lines basically ring the island. And as the birds are flying from the sea to the breeding grounds, they don't see the power lines. Um, and so they collide with them and they either die outright or die later. So we've been working with the local power company, KAUC, on ways to um, reduce this mortality. And um, you know, the most obvious way is to remove the lines entirely, to get rid of them or to underground them. Because um, if they're not there, the birds can't collide with them. But that can be very expensive um, or impossible to do in some areas. So we've also looked at other um, different ways of doing it. One was to create a um, laser fence to fire across the, the front of the power lines. You can see that's the top right there. And the idea there is to create a green um, visual fence so the birds see they fly up and over that um, visual area and in doing so avoid hitting the lines. Um, or the bottom right, we have diverters put across many of the lines now. This is one outside the town of Panapepe, um, where again, it's all about making the lines more vis visible for the birds to see and thus not collide with them. Light attraction. 
Uh, Kawhi is actually one of the poster childs, unfortunately, for uh, fallout and light attraction um, in, in the region. Um, it's well known for the fallout of mule shearwaters. And the birds are attracted to these lights. They circle them like moths and they end up on the ground where they're either eaten by cats and dogs or run over by cars. Um, and that top right picture there is actually a really um, bright lights that were up in the mountains at an Air Force station. And so we, which caused uh, a massive fallout of birds. So we've been working with various entities um, on the island to dim their lights. <clears throat> and here's an example. So this is the same area as that top right um, before they dim their lights and after. And now they've got these really low lights that they don't even turn off much of the time. And we've seen fallout basically reduced to zero. But it is still indeed a problem on the island. And one we've got to keep working with people on. Also, we work with this really great project, the Save Our, Shear Save Our Shearwaters program. And they've been working um, for many decades now on um, working with the general public. The general public find the birds on the ground. Uh, they take them to um, boxes, rescue boxes that are at fire stations. And then the Save Our Shearwaters team rescue these birds and uh, rehabilitate and release them. And they've released somewhere in the region of 33,000 new shearwater fledglings um, over the years, which is a lot of endangered birds. Invasive species, yep, we basically have most of them. Um, here's one of my pet peeves, the cat, um, emerging from a, a burrow on one of our cameras with a new shearwater in its burrow and the remains of a new shearwater below. And so what we've done here is we focused on the main areas where we know the birds are, which is basically up in this top uh, northwest of the island, and worked with a variety of partners that includes Halix Ecosystem Restoration, um, National Tropical Botanical Gardens, and the state of Hawaii, uh, to carry out predator control projects um, within these areas to manage these predators and remove them from the landscape, be they cats or rats, pigs or barn owls. <clears throat> and um, we actually just put this paper out uh, this year on the effects of this uh, predator control. And what we can see is it's, it's very clearly that predator control works in these areas. On the left, you have a, a model showing what would happen if uh, there was no predator control on the site. And you can see all the um, sites over uh, the next 30 years spiral towards extinction. Whereas on the right, um, this is the same model, but with the inputs are with predator control um, at the current level of predator control. And you can see that in all cases, they increase, even that bottom one, which increases very slowly, they're all increasing um, as time progresses. Uh, if you remove the predators, the birds survive and, um, and they come back to breed. It's, it's not rocket science. Um, but it's very effective. But of course, it's very challenging in these areas because uh, um, they're very remote and inaccessible and, and species like cats are extremely difficult to remove. On top of working with the birds up in the mountains, we're also exploring um, with all of our project partners, various seabird refugia. So um, on the left hand side, you see various islands. This is Lehua Islet on the top left and Maka'ai Rock Islet on the bottom left. Um, Maka'ai doesn't have any rats on it, and Lehua was part of a massive project with a large number of project partners to remove rats from the island. Once you get the rats and predators off these islands, then you see a massive boon in the seabird populations. And then on the right-hand side, um, this is the Niko Nihoku Ecosystem Restoration Project, and the idea here is to create an island within an island on the island, if that makes sense. Basically building a predator-proof fence um, on, on the mainland and then moving birds from the mountains where they're being impacted by predators into a safe and easily um, accessible area where we can manage them. Um, and, what we, uh, and then we just wait for the birds to come back once they fledge. We've got our last group of birds um, being fed and cared for right now. Um, and this year was the first time that we saw birds returning. So we actually had some of our Hawaiian petrels return to the site, which was really awesome to see. Knowledge gaps, um, like I said earlier, you've got to know where the birds are um, to protect them. So we use a range of techniques here, um, auditory surveys, that top left, we use a lot of song meters um, around the island to listen for the birds. And basically the technique here is just to map them out across the island and figure out where, where the birds are so we can protect them. And as you can see, we end up with these pretty maps. Um, this is a, the blue is New shearwater distribution and the red is Hawaiian petrol distribution. It's pretty easy to see where the birds are, and we can then focus all of our management efforts with all of our partners on these areas. And the last area where we have to deal with uh, knowledge gaps is at sea. Um, and we've done a lot of tracking of these birds of the years, fledglings and adults, to figure out where they're, um, where they're feeding. Um, if you know where they're feeding at sea, then you know what, which of those marine threats um, are going to face them, like uh, issues with overfishing or plastics, um, climate change, bycatch. 
you can see that the Newells have uh, this sort of focus in the north of the island, whereas the Hawaiian petrels in the bottom right do these amazing arcing journeys up towards Alaska and back again to feed their chicks. And I thought I'd close with this slide here. This is actually a little Hawaiian petrel which fledged last year from Kauai um, and his epic journey um, west across the whole region. And I think this really sort of, to me, encapsulates um, you know, the challenges and the, um, the challenges of seabird conservation and the amazing journeys these, bird takes, these birds take because this bird crossed um, this huge open stretch of ocean. It passed multiple different countries, multiple different islands. It cruised around Japan and the Philippines and South Korea. If you think about all those different areas and all the different challenges that um, this bird can face, it really drives home the fact that you know, conservation of seabirds, indeed conservation of all the species that use our marine environment um, require international cooperation um, and many, many different people working together to help protect them. So I'd just like to say mahalo for listening. Thanks to all of our project partners and funders and I look forward to any questions. Brilliant, that was amazing. I can't believe how, how far that bird flew. And yeah. that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for that, Andre. And thanks to all our speakers. I think we've probably got a few minutes uh, now, hopefully um, that we can uh, put a couple of questions. In fact, Andre's last slide really leads us on into um, perhaps one of um, the first questions that I was thinking of putting to our panel. Um, and that is that being a migratory species appears to be such a conservation challenge. And so how can we collaborate to manage these shared resources across the region more effectively? So here, that's putting you guys on the spot a little bit. So if, if any of you would like to try and address that question, um, please go ahead. So I'll, I'll put it to you again, that being a migratory species appears to be more of a conservation challenge than perhaps other species we've just seen, uh, particularly in the, in the picture of the Hawaiian petrel flying so far. So how can we collaborate to manage these resources more re across the region more effectively? What can we do? Well, I guess because it was uh, my Hawaiian petrel there that initiated that question, I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the first thing is to um, actually get more information about these birds and identify um, the routes that they're taking or, or any of the species we're talking about, all this tracking work that um, several of the speakers discussed. If we don't know where they are and what they're doing, then we can um, get that international collaboration in the first place. And then once we've got that information, it's really important to get it out um, as far as possible, not just to the scientific community, but also to all of the different uh, people who have an interest in uh, conservation or the natural environment. Um, so it's a combination of the two. You really have to have the research and the outreach, in my opinion. Yeah, no, totally agreed. So I've just had a little message from Junie and she is suggesting um, that for the rest of our questions and answers, if everybody would like to, to move to the lounge, if anybody has, uh, is interested in having some more discussion, um, I can see there's quite a few questions coming across on the feed there now, uh, and I haven't given our panelists a chance to answer that question. So um, if everybody would like to move across to the lounge, you know how to do that. Um, we just will uh, um, go out of this current session and go back into the, the main um, platform and you'll see there's a, an option to move to the lounge and there's one on oceans. So if we all go in there, um, we should be able to continue this discussion. So thank you very much, everybody. And for those who can't join us in the lounge, thanks for joining.